Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Parham, an education assistant at the Northeast Resource Recovery Association. I want to warmly welcome you to the final webinar offering of the summer webinar series. Today, we explore event waste reduction, styling your event recycling plan. Next slide, please. Do you need professional credits? You can receive one hour professional development credit by participating in this live webinar and completing the short survey at the end. Although this is the final webinar in our summer webinar series, you can continue your learning with the 2020 summer webinar recordings all year long by visiting our website at nrarecycles.org. Next slide. I'd like to set the table for this go-to webinar. Participants will not be able to be heard by the presenters or other participants during this presentation. If you cannot hear the presenters' voices, please click the audio arrow in your control panel and choose computer audio. If that does not work, select the phone call option and follow the directions. We hope that you will ask questions and our presenters will do their best to answer them as time allows. Click on the question block in the control panel and type in your questions. Please keep questions short and to the point. Next slide. Here's some information about the Northeast Resource Recovery Association. We are a recycling nonprofit. We have 400 members, primarily municipalities, and we were founded nearly 40 years ago. Next. So what do we do? We do cooperative marketing and purchasing. We enable communities to manage their own recycling programs and offer over 40 programs, including single stream and municipal solid waste. We connect sellers of recyclables to purchasers. Next slide. We provide education and technical assistance through workshops, facility tours, an annual conference, a school club, and of course, webinars. Next slide. I want to thank. And now I would like to introduce our presenter for today. Our feature presenter for today is Cindy Sterling. Cindy joined NRRA after years of service as an educator, grant writer, and programs coordinator at the Wyndham Solid Waste Management District in Vermont. Prior to working in Vermont, she was a senior solid waste specialist for the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, a national organization based out of Washington, D.C. Cindy joins us today to discuss event waste reduction by styling your event recycling plan. Thank you for being with us, Cindy. On behalf of the NRRA, I'd like to welcome you to the summer webinar series and turn this presentation over to you. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, so I've been in the solid waste industry for a long time, and I have to say that doing events, I love doing events. I love doing household hazardous waste collections because that's an event. I love doing all of these festivals that people have going on around while we're collecting trash. And so um, this would be a time that actually I would be leaving a pretty major event, uh, Labor Day weekend event, and I'd be coming back from it. And um, I would be pretty burnt out and tired. Uh, so it's, it's for me right now today. Thank you for the opportunity to live this virtually because that's what's happened to events these days. Uh, we've gone virtual. And so we're going to cover today. Well, first, we got to take a moment of silence and just really think about an unforgettable event, which was September 11th, 2001. Events impact people's lives. Nearly 3,000 Americans uh, died. The U.S. in countless ways. Yeah, global war on terror started. Anyways, we don't want really to talk about that. Let's talk about some fun events. So um, perhaps, perhaps we can do better. Um, this grant, which is funded by the USDA, that was to put us out there to spread the word about recycling and composting at events. Um, again, an unforgettable event happened, which was COVID-19. So it, it sort of uh, changed things around a little bit. 
I just want to take a moment, though, if you bear with me, Ben, I'm going to just read the first paragraph to what we had for our proposal for perhaps promoting recycling at public spaces and events. Perhaps we can do better. So this grant proposed to support the protection of drinking water resources and encourage mindful materials management practices through public health and environmental education programs in public spaces. Our public spaces have become virtual, but at the time we were hoping those public spaces would continue to be physical. Public spaces are open and accessible to all people, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, age, or socioeconomic level. Parks, towns, squares, and public libraries are comic public spaces, all of which uh, pretty much were shut down. Connecting spaces such as sidewalks and streets are also public spaces. Schools and other municipal buildings are public spaces that encourage use of space for productive social and academic performances. Teaching and learning can become inherently spontaneous and student-centered when moved from the confines of the classroom into the world at large. Public spaces promote a healthy community ecology. They facilitate the cross-pollination of ideas and conversations between individuals. They are an ideal venue for daily or weekly events or seasonal or annual fairs that bring together diverse populations and by their very nature, generate a concentrated waste stream, a concentrated waste stream at a rate typically far in excess of daily normal per capita generation. Thank you for letting me read that introduction paragraph because it has been frustrating. Like we have this grant, perhaps, perhaps we can do better and we were going to promote recycling at public spaces and those public spaces closing down and the schools and what can we still do, right? So for today, we're going to talk about the basics of event planning, regardless of what your platform is. The show goes on, which is wonderful. Um, because shows have gone on because people, they depend on the money that they're getting from events. Um, sometimes that's their annual income or at least puts a big dent in the budget there, you know, really helps promote the budget. And then zero waste is um, sort of fun because we always want to talk about can we actually do an event that's going to be zero waste. Um, there, no, maybe 90%. Pack in, pack out. I guess if you don't offer anything, then there will be no waste. Um, so let's start with first best management practices. Pre-event planning. We went from September 11th, 2001 to COVID. Uh, you still need to do pre-event planning regardless you try to do it uh, five to six months to the actual event. If you're a crew chief, um, you need to establish establish your goals, which means are you going, what are you going to recycle? What do you want to compost? What are your goals for the event? Maybe you just want to take it from aluminum cans to paper. Um, are you going to have food? Who are your vendors? You've got to reach out to those vendors in the beginning and let them know what your plans are. Volunteers, um, to get volunteers for doing waste management in my many years, uh, usually it's, it's uh, not many people want to go to an event and manage waste. Right, they would rather go to an event and volunteer and be like, I'm gonna do trafficking, or I'm gonna do tickets, um, or I'm gonna do merchandise, because uh, uh, managing waste is very physical, and you wanna make sure that you uh, put your volunteers where they need to be. Uh, site logistics is huge as well, and then publicity, and you'll see that publicity happens throughout, before, during, and after. Always good to get young blood to volunteer, um, but there's quite a variety of ages and many different places for those volunteers to do their best. So as I said in the beginning, we're gonna establish our goals. So you have your task list with your due dates. And like I said, this starts early. Crew chiefs are meeting six months prior 
uh, maybe nine months prior to the event. And then we start meeting regularly, like four months prior to it. Um, and so what is my task list? Do I need to get uh, supplies? What supplies do I have left over from last year? What needs to be repaired? Uh, what is our purchase plan, right? If we're gonna do bulk order, donations, do we have to build something? Um, and then what were the past difficulties? It's, you know, radios, vehicles, communication is big when you're doing any of these events to be able to talk to anyone who's saying, hey, we need some. So this is this is a fun thing. Because we're doing waste, people think that we're also associated with like toilet paper and human waste, which is fine. But we always get those calls about we need toilet paper in the port of johns um, and they they end up being the solid waste crew. The recycling crew's responsibility uh, and which is good because we're collecting all that stuff and there's a lot of toilet paper that is collected at the very end of some of these lengthy festivals and so that's another thing too like what is your venue is it just for a day is it indoors or outdoors um, are there campers involved is it a whole week is it just a wedding so what i'm going to share with you today is actually some larger events but all of this can still go with if you're just doing something in your school or in a hotel or anything that's smaller, um, the plan is the same. Your event coordinator and manager, total contact person right there, whoever's that general manager of the event, um, you will stay very close to them. The thing about doing the solid waste and recycling is we get close to everybody. Uh, it's across the board. We talk with everyone. Um, and that's why you need the contact information for everyone, not just the manager, every single crew chief, everyone out there that you need to get a hold of. Um, you have to have their phone numbers. Volunteer staff tasks and shifts. Again, establish the goals. How long, how many volunteers do you have? Uh, you, there's a lot of times that people just, you know, they want folks that are community service that are going to volunteer to do a festival and they decide not to show up because it's just not important enough for them that day. And unfortunately, they're usually on the recycling and trash crew. Uh, as I said, it's, it's, you need to know, you need to get staff. That's one thing I've learned is I am not going to do an event without at least two people that have also been hired to do the event with me. Because at least I know we three can hustle around and do what needs to get done. It is deathly to show up and depend on volunteers and those volunteers aren't there and then it's just you, the, the person who's in charge, the crew chief in charge of the waste. Um, production staff is key. Uh, so if you have a festival and you have the folks that are building the stage, whatever, running around, once they're done building stages and, and that, they're always good to grab if you need to grab them to help you out. Um, I just want to point out this map is uh, fun because as I said, uh, pre-event, you try to plan everything. You're like, oh, I'm going to plan this and that and it's going to work exactly how I think it's going to work and it never does. But we had this great idea for strolling of the heifers to actually give the vendors maps that said, okay, this is where you're going to be. You know, so when you come in, you go over here. Then we set up our waste stations, you know, based on all of that signage. What where are they? Like what are they food vendors? Are they just craft vendors? Um, and then that's how you establish your waste. I took on for a couple of years being a vendor coordinator as well as the waste coordinator and it sounded like a good idea in the beginning because we talked to the vendors to, at the get-go but um, it's not a good idea. I would never want to be the vendor coordinator again to set those people up on a map on the land but you do need to connect with your vendors. So food and vendors, consider the type of waste generated what is your alternative materials? Um, a lot of the times in the beginning, again, like I said, nine months prior, you're sitting down, you're talking about what the plan is going to be. You want to start pulling in vendors, right? That's how event people make their money is through the vendors. 
And right then and there, you want to be like, okay, if you're a food vendor, this is what we're going to ask of you. You know, you've already looked at what's recyclable or compostable, what's doable in my town or for my event. And then you want them, you know, and, and in the beginning too, you could say, we can do a bulk purchase. So we're going to get a whole bunch of compostable bio bags um, for doing food waste. And, you know, we're going to offer those to you or buy into that as part of being a vendor. So exploring those alternative materials. Um, same with incorporating mandates and or suggestions. Yes, there are times that when those vendors sign up and pay for their booth, they are going to agree to certain parameters that have to do with waste management. Another one is bringing your own container. So this last um, festival we did, we were asking folks to bring their own buckets because usually the vendors don't and then they start using all the containers that are out there on the lawn and the field and um, it's nice if they can bring their own buckets we ended up providing buckets and as you can see on this picture too like it is good if you can provide the containers and have the time and that pre-planning period that you go to your home depot or you start you know going to the back of dunkin donuts and salvaging whatever these five gallon buckets are collecting all that material that you need to keep the cost down um, we did kitty uh, boxes before. Kitty litter boxes were great as well, those kitty litter plastic containers. Again, though, you're looking at, are we going to be composting? Are we going to be recycling? Uh, what is our stream going to be? So here is another example of you're in an area, you're going to have a festival. This is what they're recycling. So yes, we recycle these items, we compost these items, you send this information to your vendors ahead of time, like right there, when they're signing up to be a vendor, you're sending them this, back to the whole mandate idea, this is how we're running the business. We also like to do this little incentives, which could be like little posters that go by the vendor that says that they're an eco vendor, that they're trying to reduce their waste as much as possible. They uh, were really conscious about reusing items for their booth. I mean, you can get crazy with it. Uh, again, how much time do you have to put into it pre-festival so then once the festival happens, it all falls into place. Central collection containers versus the public collection pods, and this is what I was talking about earlier with, if you don't get those vendors set up to manage the waste pretty much independently, like you can run by and manage the waste for them, but you need to set it up because they have a lot of waste. And if they start throwing their waste um, and recyclables, cardboard, huge, as well as the compost, organic waste, if you decide to go that route, they're throwing that stuff right out there in these little areas. We have these little pictures over here to the left and they are putting their stuff with that. And that is, you don't want that, it's too much. You want them to, utilize the actual central collection containers as best as you can. And so then you set those up close enough to the vendors so it's easy for them. Or you make sure that you say, hey, you have a bunch of cardboard, just start crushing it down, packing it behind me. We'll keep coming by as best as we can to take care of your waste. It's like curbside collection. But the moment they start, and especially at the end of festivals is when it gets crazy, but you know, they start throwing their mix in with the attendee mix. Um, it's, it's, it's more than what your volunteers, you know, and hopefully you have a nice set of volunteers, number of volunteers that are working for you. Um, so again, location is based on the food vendors, right? Big containers next to them. And then signs are based on your vendors. Uh, what you find out ahead of time what food is being produced so you know what ways to put on the signage. And it is really fun if you can make the homemade signs. Um, a lot of people can't, I mean, if you're stuck, if you're doing a festival over and over and over again every year, you can make your signs accordingly so they last every year. Otherwise you can get people involved with doing homemade signs um, and containers just a day or two beforehand. And these are your volunteers. Those are the ones that you want to be making those signs ahead of time. So recruiting your volunteers, environmental groups, green clubs, uh, 
some sort of incentive, make give them a free t-shirt, give them lunch, food while they're there, maybe tickets towards food, um, accommodations. If you're doing a, a lengthy festival, they get free camping and then also free food and showers. So that's another huge thing with um, trash. Folks in recycling, you we always get the free showers. So some people, most people have to pay for showers, but because if you work the recycling crew, that's an incentive for you at a lengthy festival. Uh, rotations and scheduling, it's pretty much four hour shifts. Uh, again, depends on the length of your schedule, but you really wanna look to two to four hour shifts. Um, and then the training, yeah, it's it's, Everyone trains at the beginning of each scheduled rotation. You go through it um, and know what they have to do. We love to have people that are just standing by the containers the entire time, telling people what to do and hopefully not getting into fights with them. Compostable wear can definitely bring on some arguments um, versus plastic wear. You can't always have that. You don't always have that freedom to have that luxury, to have a person who's always going to be standing next to the containers. So again, make sure that your signage is good. And also that's the rotation of it, right? You run through it, you like, you go around, if you're cleaning it up, people follow, they look in the bin and they just sort of follow what they see if they're not going to read the signs to begin with. So if you have few volunteers, just you know, make sure you use them wisely and they're making things neat. You never want the trash to be yucky. It, you know, you don't want those piles. If you have piles of stuff, you put them behind stuff. That's why these um, right here, these bins that we built, uh, they were built to be like eight feet high and banners. And they actually it was a grant um, where we used all reusable. It was all salvaged material to build these uh, 10 of them way stations. And as you can see, uh, the wind would, loves them. So sometimes you have to be very careful because it's like a kite and you may need to put a, uh, some sort of wind barrier behind it or be looking for some stones and uh, bricks to weigh it down a little bit. Um, so your stations, your site logistics are huge. What kind of stations are you going to need? Do you want to have something that's eight feet tall that you know tells exactly what you're collecting, set it up, and people can find it easily? Uh, sometimes it's more like the recycle mobile here, like maybe you're uh, in a place that dictates uh, something with a trailer, smaller pavement. Um, same with the can cage. So you're going to look at what is your uh, logistics for your site and what type of containers are you going to need to make this happen. And again, you start salvaging them as much as possible, collecting them, and then hopefully you have the volunteers that can make the signs ahead of time. And if you're doing the same festival year after year after year, then you can get more professional with uh, fine tuning your signage. Um, so publicity that we talked about, we have the vendors, right, right off the bat, your ticket folks, you know, if people are buying tickets to it, that's where you want to publicize what's going on, especially if they're camping, you want to let them know ahead of time, like, this is what we're doing in the campground, this is what we're recycling, it's, that's, you, and that's a part that a lot of people overlook, they don't get it right from the beginning, uh, right on the website. Um, you want to get it out locally in your local news. You and you know, if, and again, if you've been doing it for a few years, you have good pictures that you can share. Um, but you just want them to know because when they show up, there's going to be certain rules and regulations, and it's nice for everyone to know ahead of time. Just to review, planning your event, know your venue. Know your event size and audience. Oh, I didn't mention waste hauler. Yes, that's number one too. Find out who's hauling the waste. Like I said, what's recyclable, what's compostable, what's trash, what's the cost of all that, what bins are available to you through your waste hauler. 
uh, permits and signage, bins and signage, and your volunteers. And staff, make sure you have a couple paid staff on hand. So that's all pre. Now we're at the event. Same idea though, looking at it, setting up the event. Um, I, when I started doing, you know, some events you show up just at eight in the morning, it starts at nine, no big deal. Other events you can get away with showing up like the day before. Um, the larger events that I do, I have given myself permission to now try to show up a few days before. I pretty much show up when the site crew shows up and they're building the stages and fencing everything off and getting it ready. It makes it a lot easier. You can uh, check on your equipment. You can see if things need to be repaired. Um, as I said, you can plan, 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 and there's always gonna be something that's gonna go wrong. You know, generators aren't gonna happen or who knows, it's crazy, you know, golf cart doesn't work and now you have to hustle up another golf cart or bicycles are always a good backup. Um, your volunteers, it's nice to get them uh, set up. You are contacting your volunteers weeks prior and sending them lists of this is what's expected of you, this is what I want you, you know, you should wear, right? It's always good to wear uh, closed toed shoes because people don't think about that. They show up and they're just gonna wear their flip-flops. Um, same as as simple as sunscreen and rain gear, like all that stuff that you have to sort of think about to remind people, because they don't know, they're just coming to have fun and you know, gonna volunteer for a little bit while they're having fun. On-site education, that again was part of the pre-planning, knowing what's needed. So you did all the pre-stuff when people registered, vendors, ticket folks, um, other crew chiefs, just letting everyone know what's happening, but then there's the on-site education. So, um, you know, the events that I do that are large enough where people are camping, I actually have my volunteers uh, the day that the campers are coming in, because campers can always come in earlier than the show begins, and they have little postcards, you know, and they have a recycle bag and they have a trash bag, and they have a postcard that they hand out to every single person. And it's a captured audience. I mean, that's the same with like an HHW event. I love HHW events because people are in line and it's a great time to be able to educate them about what's expected and say hi and this and that. Um, so that on-site education also like where are you placing those bins and the signage that goes with that. And then public publicity throughout, you know, make yourself enjoyable like you're shining you're collecting all these people's waste you know great time great time to educate them so setting up always make sure you have um the latrines the porta johns great place to educate um always need some sort of central area so even if it's a day event you're gonna have the staging area usually that's where the production person is um, and so you're there too all your containers are there you set them up all your supplies that you need to give people um, those the shift changes they all come to that place that's where the information gets passed uh, they know that's where they're going to find you um, so yeah so that's why we have those stations set up you need those some people when they do events um, this is something I've never done um, could be interesting they actually like sort all the waste in one little sort station area. Uh, for me, it's enough just to be collecting it, recycling it, keeping it clean, composting it without actually weighing it and figuring it out. I mean, I, I weigh, I weigh, I, I measure by, you know, volume kind of thing and I know the weights. And that's one thing too, when you have your haulers, just get your weights afterwards so you can record and see what you're doing and those are your goals that you may want to set like hey we were able to recycle 80 percent this year you know we're going to go for 90 percent next year what's what's that plan going to be to put that into place so gotta have people that don't mind working in the sun getting dirty setting everything up beforehand organizing it 
signage. Like I said, I use the Porta Johns. I put my signage inside the door so when they're sitting there, they can see what's recyclable and what's going on. Always have them by the Porta Johns. So again, as we talked about neatness, you know, you bag it up, you put it behind, you just keep it neat. It doesn't have to be overflowing. You may come by later with your container, your cart, your bicycle, golf cart, whatever you have to use to collect it. Um, yes, yeah, so here we are at equipment. Um, there was one year that I got used to having a um, loader to compact my boxes. And then they told me that that guy was not coming back. And that was really difficult because uh, that's how I save, is by compacting my boxes. And um, thankfully, there was a person, this is why you, when you get good volunteers, you hold on to them, you give them everything to make them come back and just treat them like the princes and princesses that they are. I happen to have a volunteer on my team that was a farmer, and he said, I have this little tractor thing. And I was like, oh my God, thank you, bring that, we're using it. because the production manager, site manager, anybody else who wasn't doing my crew, they were like, oh, we don't need that big machine that we've been paying for to move rocks and tables. We can do it for something less. But I needed that. And that's why that beginning crew chief meetings, right from nine months early, you get together with your crew chiefs and you know exactly what you're expected with one another and what you need to make it happen. Um, I have my camper here because that's another thing that I realized if you're going to do a festival for a while and you're managing waste, you know, the weather, it rains, you come back to a tent, it's a little tough on the body. It's nice to make sure you have a happy home to come to. Uh, the, uh, this uh, chariot, we call it, uh, this is what it looked like. It was just black. Someone built it. We actually need to rebuild that. Um, and then one year, again, connecting with other volunteers, uh, there were a couple of people on the site crew that said, hey, we want to paint your chariot. And they did a beautiful job. Like now that we have to rebuild the chariot, I'm trying to figure out how to save the artwork if it's possible. It's pretty much the trail that needs to be rebuilt and does. So that's another thing. You come in and you're like, oh my God, I have a flat tire on my chariot. Like I'm depending on this chariot to haul a bunch of waste and containers for setup and breakdown and now the tire is blown so give yourself enough time to plan ahead love the golf carts you can get very creative with that we actually started taking pallets and adding them onto the golf carts so that's another thing too. make sure make clear you need handy dandy golf carts you need your containers you have your volunteers you schedule them in between lots of different ages and you figure out who can do what. Um, sometimes people can just be pickers, right? We always leave the place a lot cleaner than when it, when it was when we arrived. Um, you wanna be able to have, as I'm mentioning, volunteers that can actually take care of problems. So this is the water tank that we were using to wash down the containers afterwards and uh, needed to get up there to get the hose. So it is good to have some young bucks, if you can, on your volunteer crew. They're very different ages. Um, and you, yeah, you have to put them, put them where they belong, where everybody belongs. And um, you get your crew going. I am happy to say that most of my festivals that I've been doing for a very long time now, I can actually sit down and enjoy the festival and check out the vendors and not be on alert 100% because my crews have kept coming back and they know what they're supposed to do. It's, it's pretty great. It's So on-site education, again, signs, uh, starting something new, like I said, having people actually standing by the containers is always best. People love to talk about trash constantly. Let's just keep talking about our waste stream as we're doing it. Um, publicity that I talked about, right? Here's our golf cart. Uh, that's just setting up. 
decorating it, right? Doing everything and everything that you can do to make it happy. Actually, one year I had some folks that said, hey, we're gonna decorate the golf carts this year, uh, bring stuff. And we had instruments. We had one golf cart that was just filled with like a drum and a horn and um, we're there. You're collecting trash. You're interacting with everyone. You're collecting their waste. Um, this is setting up when it's actually happening. This is exchanged with bags of trash. We've gotten really good about knowing bungee cords, uh, very important piece of equipment, have good bungee cords, definitely need those grabbers, uh, litter pickers, buckets, because um, we'll bungee cord trash bags up on top of that. And then again, depending on the size of your festival, you start finding people that are just going to go around and take care of just the waste. Other people are going to go around and take care of just the compost. Others are going to go around and take care of the recyclables. It, it's, it's a moving, it's just always moving. You just got to be able to adjust. Um, another important piece, uh, publicity here, right? So this is the folks that have that container gave it to us. We used it for trash. We probably should have used it for recyclables because it was so beautiful, but we ended up putting our trash sign on it. You need to have these little platforms and steps. Um, hauling heaving bags, as we all know, is not a lot of fun over those rims. And so having, having this platform works well, as well as if you have the pickup truck and a, a cargo truck or anything, even your golf cart, you know, you, you still have the ability to haul it. Um, okay, so. Where's it going now? The show goes on. Strolling of the Heifers is uh, some that I shared with you. They are in June. The money that they get supports a lot of local farms. Um, and they too had to sort of readjust. And so they readjusted by still reminding people that they're helping farmers. Um, the virus may have canceled our parade, but we created new ways to support our farmers and help our community gain access to good, healthy local food sources. So this was beautiful. This was actually um, a parade with animals and uh, again, taking care of waste. We did have clowns. We had people dressed up as clowns that took care of the animal waste uh, during the parade too, although uh, that was not composted. That just went into the trash. Then uh, Rhythm and Roots, these guys, uh, a lot of those pictures that you saw with the chariot, this is where I would have been for Labor Day weekend. Uh, they took all of their footage, like for years, right? 20 something years, 23 years they've been around um, making movies and recording. And that's how they decided to have the show go on because these event people, like I said, depend on that. That's your budget. That's a really hard time right now. It's it's sad. So Rhythm and Roots, totally bummed. Rhythm and Roots had to be canceled this year. Missing the music, the merriment, and the merch. So they're selling new t-shirts for this year. Uh, advertising, again, publicizing that the show must go on. Um, and then also, like I said, playing the music uh, over the weekend and, and you could buy into the live stream. And so the question about zero waste, so the very one of the very first festival actually it was Strolling of the Heifers when they asked me to take care of it and they wanted to do zero waste. Our plan was, all right, then we just don't put trash cans around there, right? We have these stations. We, we're going to build these stations using the grant, you know, reusable material from the salvage uh, businesses. And people have to go find the stations. They're big, they're colorful, they're right there. There's 10 of them. Um, as you can see, people decided that they weren't going to take the time to go find the stations. So, again, learning, put something there, just like putting them next to the toilets, collect it, compost it. Don't expect people to really have that zero waste mentality because they become litterers. They'll, oh, <laughs> they're just gonna litter. 
um, at the end, washing up, cleaning up, make sure you have your volunteers and people to help you because that's that's the part that no one understands is like I said, you have to leave the place as beautiful or even better than you showed up and started your festival. And um, you need to have people to wash the containers no matter what size it is. Even if it's just a day festival, the containers need to be cleaned at the end and organized and put back and you need to check your supplies so you have knowledge of what's for next year and signage and write good notes because when it comes around again uh, a year later, you're like, hmm, I thought I wrote good notes about that. And if you did write good notes, you're good to go. Because like I said, you start planning nine months prior, then four months regular meetings. So we do have to remember to rock on regardless where we're at whether it's 2001 or 2020 keep the vibe alive these this is the family and uh that's involved with rhythm and roots it's a family event and a lot of these are lots of people with big hearts are doing these festivals Additional resources, we can send these to you if you need them. Uh, I didn't make a handout of it, but we can easily do that for you. Uh, there's lots of resources out there. Uh, lots of good guides and whatnot. That's it. I'm doing good with time. Do we have any questions or comments? Hi, Cindy. I don't see any questions coming in from attendees today, um, but I would like to thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Um, your knowledge and expertise in this area uh, is really uh, is really something to see. Um, thank you so much for sharing today. Um, like I said, I don't oh, I do see something come in right now. Let's see what we yeah. Please, please ask questions because I might have been a little scattered because it's really hard when um, you do so much of the, so many of these, and then there may be some real basic stuff that I totally breezed over. So if All you right, ask me, questions, that's going to help me. Yeah, let me share this question with you, Cindy. It's uh, tell us more about the conversation between compostable forks versus plastic. Ooh. And then my understanding is that certain commercial composting can handle compostables and others cannot. How do you handle this at festivals? Right, so, and that's where it comes down to the beginning of first, you're checking what your waste haulers are taking. So if you have folks that are composting in the area, then you're checking in with them and you're saying, okay, what do you want? What can I put into your compost, right? So. The um, Rhythm and Roots, uh, I've been doing it for seven years now. And last year, we finally broke out and decided to do composting. And it took that long because um, they didn't have the aluminum down. They didn't have the plastic down. Like the basic recycling was a mess. So uh, I had to get that straightened out first. And then I was like, okay, now we're ready to compost. We you know, had the tractor and had some containers. I went to the farm. Um, actually, one of my guys in Rhode Island went to the farm and talked to the people. And even when I showed up on site and I said, okay, what's compostable? I've been doing this before, so I know what's compostable. The compostable plastic, that's always a kicker. A lot of people don't want the compostable ware, regardless that they say it's compostable, green ware. You might get people that say we're okay with the compostable bags, the bio bags because they're thin enough. Um, if you get people that don't want that, then you're just dumping it. You're just like, I did a seafood festival for so many years. How lovely, oh wait, in a dairy festival. How lovely is that? Emptying out bags of seafood and dairy into the container, right? The compost container. So it's, you know, most likely a four yarder but you're not putting any plastic in there so you're collecting it in plastic because that's the easiest way to transport it but then once you finally get to your central collection container 
you're hopefully stepping up those steps and you have some sort of staging so you can dump that bag. Um, otherwise, you're down low trying to dump it and you're going to walk home with a lot of muck on you. That's why showers are a good thing. So the compostable wear is always tricky. So these folks in this farm that we started last year composting, I walked in like, all right, I know what I'm doing. No compostable wear, but you tea bags, all you know, basic stuff. Paper's okay. I can do my napkins, my soiled paper. We're good. They came back to me and said, no, none of that, because they didn't know me, and they didn't they didn't want a contaminated load. So they basically told me I could do just pre, you know, prep waste and um, the coffee grounds and stuff, but no paper. I could not do any soiled paper. And so again, long way of saying, you need to talk with your, your sources. You need to talk to whoever is gonna be taking your waste, whether it's recycling, compost, whatever, and then you need to make your signs accordingly. And that's why you do your research ahead of time, because it's gonna change. It, change. it changes with the location. It's not universal. Thank you for that, Cindy. Um, I don't see any additional questions coming in. I was curious, um, seeing so much of the signage that you had at these, uh, at these events, um, what do you think is the most effective uh, type of sign? Is it, is it typically written? you know, word written or, or is it, uh, you know, images being used or is it actual, uh, you know, recycling bottles or whatnot that's put up on a sign to, uh, to get the point across? Yeah. What's most effective? I, I, I went back to this one here. The most effective is actually having, and I had so many great pictures. I have pictures of like cans, right? You have the can with the hole in the top and then you you put the whatever the material is that's going to go into that can, duct tape it. Always make sure you have duct tape and packing tape um, and box cutters. So you just, you know, that's the most effective, actually knowing what the waste is. And that, again, is in that beginning, like, what is the waste going to be? Who are the vendors? What kind of food? Uh, what kind of containers are they going to have? Do I ask them? You know, and I say, hey, we're going to be all compostable containers. So now I'm asking of you as a vendor to purchase that kind of container. And again, that's where you get back to maybe if you can arrange some bulk orders for them to ease up that cost a little bit. Um, back to the mandates. Because um, you have to, these are people's money. This is how they make their money, and they're going to try to make it as best they can. Um, and so asking extra expenses for them, again, you want to be able to um, make it as gentle as possible. Um, and so, yes, then you take those containers, and, the, and that's the best way, is the actual three-dimensional. And the, the toilets. The toilets are the best place to advertise. And that can be regular signage, just printed. Yeah, I noticed that as well. I, I got a chuckle over that, but it's quite effective, no doubt. Yeah. So, waiting on any additional questions. We don't seem to be getting anything else in, Cindy. Okay. Um, so. Oh. Um, I'll just add something more about central collection containers, um, mm -hmm. if anyone gets to that extent. You know, these, and I'm thinking about this now because I just went to this slide, but these are stuff, uh, signs that I made for the central collection because, again, you have these 30-yard open tops out there, or even if it's a dumpster, whatever, you know, they're out there, and people could be like, oh, great, I can throw anything in there. And so there's a magnet. I mean, these are signs that it's, are worth investing in. Like, we've always done... Duct tape, duct tape on the uh, container that says recycle or trash, and the haulers don't like that so much because when you peel off the duct tape, it takes away the painting. One year, we actually decided to spray paint, but it was stuff that was supposed to be like an auto primer layer, so we thought it would come off pretty easily, but it didn't. So... Um, Doing signs that are magnets or that are weather resistant and that you can tie to the central collection helps because you take all this time to go from individual sites, right? Bring it to a central collection. 
that central collection site is where it's going to then. What if someone starts contaminating your 30 yarder that was so beautiful with bottles and cans and now someone threw their uh, tent on top of it? So the signage is very important. I'm glad you brought that up, Ben, because that is a kicker all the time. And that's where it also comes into just keeping it clean. You've got to always be ready to just dive in and clean up the waste. Right. Well, so much of what you've spoken to is has to do with communication. So I know okay. signage would be just critical. Yes. Well, it's great to hear the little bits of tricks of the trade there, Cindy, from you. That was another webinar a little earlier in the summer, but definitely part of event planning as well. So I still don't see any more additional questions coming in. So I think maybe uh, maybe it might be time to uh, to wrap this up. Okay, I will go to. Yeah, yes, we, we definitely want to thank our sponsors uh, for of this summer webinar series. We'd like to thank Interstate Refrigerant Recovery Incorporated, Schnitzer, and the USDA. I want to remind everyone that the post webinar survey will launch immediately after this webinar. It will also appear in your e, uh, email inbox tomorrow. As a reminder, we welcome feedback. Next slide. This concludes the NRA Summer Webinar Series. Thank you all for attending. Thanks, Ben.